Eh, pues muy, muy eh, buenos días. Eh, estamos aquí en este, nuestro ciclo de eh, seminarios de investigación y control de cáncer. El día de hoy estamos eh, eh, este, híbridos y tenemos eh, la fortuna de tener eh, a la doctora Emily Bockman en forma presencial. Este, la doctora Emily Bockman es aquí de casa en el Instituto Nacional de Salud Pública. Este, ella eh, ha, hizo investigación hace ya algunos años aquí con nosotros. Ella es, este, eh, tiene una licenciatura en este, bioquímica y biología molecular y tiene un, eh, este, una, un doctorado en epidemiología por la Universidad de, este, la Universidad de Alabama en Birmingham. Ella es actualmente eh, investigadora de la rama de, este, de epidemiología metabólica en el, en el National Cancer Institute. Y bueno, pues estamos muy contentos. Nos viene, vino de visita a, este, a buscar, bueno, a fortalecer colaboraciones ya establecidas aquí con el Instituto Nacional de Salud Pública. Y bueno, pues el día de hoy eh, nos va a presentar eh, eh, algo de trabajo que ha hecho sobre este, microbioma y cáncer. Este, pero muchísimas gracias por estar aquí, Emily. Gracias. Okay. Aquí, ahora me oyen. Okay. Ahora está bien. Oh, por eso. Ok, debo empezar a, desde el principio. Ok, pues de todos modos voy a darte una presentación en inglés porque se me dificulta mucho hablar sobre la ciencia en español. Okay, so sorry, it doesn't sound like everyone even heard me in the first place, but I really appreciate being here. It's a, you know, it's a great invitation for me after working here in the past. Um, my name is Emily Boatman. I'm an investigator at the National Cancer Institute. And when I came to the National Cancer Institute about 10 years ago, I switched my uh, research interest from what I was doing, which was nutrition and cancer. And I started focusing on the study of the human microbiome. At that time, we were starting to learn about how the microbiome inhabits you know, our body. It's the, these microbes live on and in our body. And we were starting to learn about how these microbes are related to health and also the risk of disease. So we now know that people represent kind of a human ecosystem. I have here um, a representation of the different microbes that inhabit the different body habitats. And you can see just by the colors on this pie chart, this is at the phylum level, but you can see that the microbes really differ by each body habitat. If you compare, for example, the vagina, which is, has a large majority of Firmicutes, you, you compare that to something like the um, a stomach that's inhabited with Helicobacter pylori, which is predominantly proteobacteria. We now have estimated that there's approximately 1.3 microbial cells for every human cell. And these microbes are known to influence the immune system. They also can help us metabolize various foods and other exposures. And they also can produce a variety of biocompounds. And something that's particularly interesting about the microbiome is it's modifiable. For example, when someone takes antibiotics, they can greatly change their microbiome. We can also influence our microbiome through ch extreme changes to diet. <clears throat> 
Today, I'll be focusing really on two body habitats. This is where the majority of my research focuses, but this is on the oral and the gut microbiome. So just to kind of start, this was kind of the innovation to being able to start studying the human microbiome with 16S RNA gene sequencing. This is a gene you can see here that is present in all bacteria and archaea. And by sequencing this gene, it was possible to start to understand the different bacteria that lived on the body. Um, so this is a typically a targeted amplicon sequencing of this small subunit gene. Um, we often use the V4 region for sequencing, but people use different regions. But again, they, this, this um, gene has conserved regions so we can develop the primers that are needed to amplify the section. But between these conserved regions, there's variable regions that can help identify the specific tax of bacteria. And this method is also very appropriate for samples with high human DNA content as it targets the bacteria that's present in a sample. And as I said, this is widely applied in microbiome research and it was really this technology that kind of started the um, field of, of this new field of microbiome research. So as a, just a quick overview of what I'll be presenting today is there's some standard metrics that are derived from, from ecology um, and this is, um, what we often use to measure what someone's microbiome captures. So there's something called alpha diversity, and this is the number of unique micro, or most simply, the number of most of unique microbes found in a community. So if we look here at this microbial community, this has a simple alpha diversity of three, since there's three specific bacteria found in that community. We can then compare it to another microbial community, and this has six unique microbes. So we would say that the second community has higher alpha diversity than the first community. Now I mentioned that that's kind of a simple measure. So there's other measures that can incorporate other factors such as the relative level of those bacteria and other things. We also study what's called beta diversity, and this is a, a between subjects diversity. It's really looking at the communities and seeing how similar they are between, between individuals or between populations. And so in this example, if we have one person at, with, that has community one and one person that has community two, there's two shared bacteria and there's five different bacteria. And, as a, and this is also a simple way to look at it. So there's many different ways to measure the beta diversity in a sample. But as I mentioned, it's this dissimilarity between people in a study. So it's a little more complicated to, to um, use standard statistical methods because it becomes a matrix of N by N individuals in your population. For that reason, there's other ways to analyze the data and to kind of visualize the data to make it more amenable to standard statistical methods. And one way that people often present beta diversity is what's called a PicoA plot or a principal coordinate analysis plot. This data is from the Human Microbiome Project and is presenting the different body sites that were incorporated in the study. So you can see here the different body sites that were incorporated in the Human Microbiome Project. And you can also see how distinct these microbial communities are between body sites. So the clustering is actually by oral versus fecal versus having it be an individual's microbiome is all the same. Um, one of, there's many limitations though to the PicoA representation of the data. Since these vectors are data dependent, they're based on the matrix you have within your study. So if I wanna add my data to another study, I have to generate a large matrix incorporating both sample sets. It's also quite difficult to interpret a PicoA vector. And for studies that have weighted data, we're currently developing methods to use these, but sometimes using a principal coordinate analysis is easier. Then finally, you can also present the data by looking at the specific taxa that are found in a sample. Um, for 16S RNA gene sequencing, we can only go down to the genus level, which is here. Um, but this is a presentation of one person's oral microbiome. This was from a study I conducted many years ago, and we actually gave each participant their results so they could know what microbes were found in their mouth. Um, and so you can see, if you look at the middle portion of that, that pie chart, that's at the phylum level. So that's one of, that's the highest level under bacteria. So you can see in this example, um, this individual has about 33% of, I think, proteobacteria. And then if we look down at the genus level, this is now the outside part of the pie chart. Um, and so that, you know, this person 
can't read it on this pre on the slide for myself, but um, they have you know th this proportion of that specific genus. Um, and so a lot of our analyses look at the specific taxonomic classifications to see if those tax are associated with disease. Um, so now after that brief introduction to, you know, microbiome kind of metrics and such, um, I want to talk about my research and kind of talk about the future. So my, my main research interest is studying the human microbiome. This is a very relatively new area of research. So a lot of my actual research has focused on the methods for how to collect the samples, how to process them, how to analyze the data. But I do this because my major research focus is understanding how the microbiome is potentially related to cancer risk and also survival after a diagnosis. I don't know what I did. Oh, oh. Got it back. But then it's also really important to start understanding how various factors may influence the microbiome. And also we are currently studying how these different factors are associated with cancer risk. But it's really important to try to figure out what you know, lifestyle factors are confounders of the association between the microbiome and cancer. So this is now the outline of my presentation. What I'm planning to present today are some of the current studies that I've been conducting looking at the microbiome and cancer. I'm specifically gonna focus on studies of lung and colorectum, but we have done a number of other studies focusing on other cancer sites. Then I'll briefly talk about some considerations for future studies for people planning to conduct these, and then also some plans for future cohort studies. So why are we interested in the microbiome and cancer? There's a number of reasons why we believe that the microbiome may be related to cancer risk. There's a lot of epidemiologic evidence that suggests there may be an association. For one, there's some conditions that are caused by microbes that are associated with cancer risk. For example, periodontal disease has been found to be associated with the risk of multiple cancers, including cancer of the esophagus, head and neck, and pancreas. Also, lung infections have been found to be associated with lung cancer risk. And we know that Helicobacter pylori is a cause of gastric cancer, and Helicobacter pylori is a bacteria. Some of the mechanisms that have been proposed for these associations are that there may be actually direct microbial interaction at the tissue. So for example, in the, in the mouth, the oral microbiome may be directly related to the risk of oral cancer. Also, my, these microbes are able to convert a variety of exposures to carcinogens, such as the conversion of ethanol to acet acetylaldehyde in the mouth. And finally, when changes to the microbiome occur, they can cause increased inflammation, one of the hallmarks of cancer. So uh, a current postdoc in the division, Semi Zwiewicz, he conducted a systematic review of all of the current studies through 2019, looking at the microbiome and cancer. And here I'm presenting the results for the oral microbiome with cancer. And you can see that, well, first, the caveat to this is most of these studies were cross-sectional. So it's not possible to really know if, the, if these associations are due to causing cancer or if they're a reflection of having cancer. So this temporality of the association isn't clear. Um, you can see that at the time, only one study had been done to look at the oral microbiome and lung cancer. Um, and there had been, well, plus this other study that had a combined outcome. But then there had been a, just a couple of studies looking at the oral microbiome with colorectal cancer. Now the fecal microbiome is really where most of the research has focused and the majority of the research has really focused on the association between the fecal microbiome and colorectal cancer. However, this caveat occurs here too is for the colorectal cancer studies, none of these studies were conducted prospectively. So these were all conducted within individuals that already had cancer. And you can see that the majority of the studies have really focused on the association between gut microbiome and colorectal cancer. And so there are promising associations. However, um, collecting fecal samples in prospective studies is really instrumental in really understanding the actual causative potential causation of um, the association between gut microbiome and, and colorectal cancer. All right, so just to start with the oral microbiome and lung cancer, since that um, systematic review, there were two prospective studies that were conducted to look at the oral microbiome and risk of lung cancer. 
The first study was conducted in the Shanghai Men's and Women's Health Studies. This included 114 incident never smoking lung cancer cases and 114 matched controls. And what they found is that alpha diversity and the relative abundance of some specific taxa were prospectively associated with the risk of lung cancer in these never smoking um, cancers. Then in the Southern Community Cohort Study, which is a diverse population in the United States, they studied 156 incident lung cancer cases and 156 controls. And they found that the relative abundance and presence of some specific taxa were prospectively associated with lung cancer risk in this diverse population. However, after adjusting for multiple comparisons, none of the associations were significant. So given that background, we in DCEG decided to conduct a large prospective case cohort study nested within three of the large cohorts we have in the division, the agricultural health study, the prostate, lung, and colorectal and ovarian cancer screening trial, and the NIH AARP diet and health study. All of these prospective cohorts collected or identified participants at their baseline recruitment, which you can see here for the agricultural health study. At the baseline, they collected a questionnaire. Then a couple years later, and this is the same for all of the cohorts, a couple years later, they collected a mouthwash sample in a subset of the participants. And so for our study, we started our baseline at the mouthwash sample collection. And then we identified all cancer cases that developed over follow-up after that baseline. And the last data follow-up differed by the different cohorts. So we did this for multiple different cancer sites to maximize our referent group. So today I'll just focus on the lung cancer association, but by combining across cohorts, we were able to identify 1500 lung cancer cases and to compare this to a reference sub cohort of about 3,300 individuals. Um, so as I mentioned, there, there were about this many lung cancer cases and a reference subcohort. And what's interesting about the way we sampled this is we could actually upweight the individuals back to the referent cohort. So we were able to represent the 91,000 individuals with a mouthwash sample. And so this was a much more powerful study. Previous studies had only included the 114 and 156 cases. Now there was a high prevalence of smoking in these cohorts, and so we needed to oversample the co the referent group for smoking status so that we had adequate matching back to the cases. And there was very strong confounding by smoking, so we had a very detailed adjustment for the smoking categories to try to um, to adjust for that specific confounding. So now to look at the results. Um, the first thing is we did all of our associations by cohort and then tested for statistical heterogeneity due to methodological differences. But what we did see is that the associations by cohort appeared to be similar. So we can really focus on the meta-analysis estimate um, for these associations. And what we saw is that a higher alpha diversity, so having more unique uh, microbes in the mouth was associated consistently with a decreased risk of lung cancer over follow-up. So it seems that having a more diverse population in the mouth was, would decrease the risk of lung cancer later. So then we stratified these results by histologic subtype. We looked at um, cases of adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and small cell lung cancer. And what we found is that that inverse association really was restricted to the squamous cell carcinoma cases. Then we also stratified this by smoking status. And what you can see here is for current in red and blue for former smokers, that the associations were inverse for both groups, but really the only statistically significant associations were among the former smokers. Then we looked at the beta diversity associations and we did a principal components analysis since this was a weighted analysis. We've since developed methods to do PicoA analysis. But we found when we looked at the, the PCA from the relative abundance for the um, amplicon sequence variants, we found a strong association between the principal component two and risk of lung cancer. And like I said, this, you know, it's kind of hard to interpret this, like what is this principal component? So we looked to see what taxa drove the association and the, 
Streptococcus, the relative abundance of streptococcus was strongly associated with this principal component. So having a larger value in this principal component meant that the person often had a higher relative abundance of this uh, streptococcus genus. And this and streptococcus was very, um, had a high relative abundance in all three of the cohorts. Then when we looked at the PCA from the presence absence, so whether they did or did not have the specific genera, we found a, a strong association with principal component one and principal component one was strongly driven by these genera. So when these genera were absent, they were likely to have a higher level of that principal component. So now then we dove into the actual taxa itself and found a number of taxa after correcting for multiple comparisons were associated with lung cancer risk. So not surprisingly, there was an association with streptococcus with lung cancer risk, which after seeing the beta diversity results, you'd kind of expect that. But we also found some of these other taxa. And many of these taxa are related to oral health parameters or also um, uh, lung infections. So to conclude from this section, in this well-powered study, we did find strong evidence that the oral microbiome is prospectively associated with lung cancer risk. And many of these associated taxa are related to these oral health parameters or pneumonia. So they're very much in line with previous epidemiologic studies. Then what's really needed is some further investigation regarding the association between the oral microbiome and tobacco use, particularly among these former smokers to try to understand why, at least in this population, the association really appeared to be restricted to former smokers. And then there's been, these are some inconsistent associations with our study and some of the previous studies, which were conducted in slightly different populations. So there's a real need for additional studies in more diverse populations. So now I'm gonna switch gears and switch to the associations with colorectal cancer. Um, one of the first studies I conducted as a postdoc at NCI was looking at the fecal microbiome and colorectal cancer in a very small, uh, case control study that was conducted in NCI in the 80s. And we were able to repurpose these fecal samples to do a case control study. And we provided our data to a group in Germany. They were actually the ones that extracted and sequenced the samples to conduct a meta-analysis of, of gut microbiome and colorectal cancer. And you can see these are some of the strongly positively associated taxa and some of the strongly negatively associated taxa from that meta-analysis of the gut microbiome and colorectal cancer. And what's interesting about these associations is many of these taxa identified in the feces were actually of oral origin that were associated with colorectal cancer risk. So like Fusobacterium and Porphyromonas, which are related to periodontal disease. So then, one previous study looked at the oral microbiome with colorectal cancer risk, and this was conducted again in that Southern Community Cohort study. And they found that some of the periodontal pathogens like Trypanema dent denticola and Prevotella intermedia were positively associated with risk of colorectal cancer. They didn't find an association with alpha diversity or beta diversity. And there were these associations with the specific taxa, but when they looked after Bonferroni correction, none of the additional taxa were associated statistically significantly. So again, I'm going back to the case cohort study that we conducted, and this study had almost 1,200 colorectal cancer cases. So we were also able to investigate whether the oral microbiome may be prospectively associated with colorectal cancer risk. And this table shows the um, hazard ratios for alpha diversity in the cohorts. And then in the meta-analysis estimate, we can just focus on the meta-analysis estimate. And there does appear to be some weak positive association between alpha diversity and risk of colorectal cancer in this analysis, but it's not statistically significant, um, but it was somewhat consistent across the cohorts. However, when I, I was trying to decide what confounders to use here, and this is kind of going back to starting to think about confounding in these studies, when I did additional adjustment for over color, overall colorectal cancer, the additional adjustment for diet, physical activity, and medication use didn't seem to modify the association. So I thought I had a good model. Then I wanted to look at the alpha diversity and site-specific risk, since we know that the risk of, of distal or proximal or rectal cancer may differ. Um, I was very surprised to find that there was 
a stronger association in distal and rectal cancer with alpha diversity. So you can see here that there appears to be potentially a strong positive association between alpha diversity and colorectal cancer. And I thought this was really exciting. You know, this, this kind of suggests that some of these associations with the gut microbiome may be seen years in the past with um, the oral microbiome. But then I decided I should probably check confounding again. And once we incorporated the adjustment of diet, physical activity, and some medications, all of the associ associations went away, you know, which really, again, signifies the need to really carefully consider confounding in these associations with the microbiome. So really for alpha diversity, it appears the association's null. Um, then we looked at some of the specific uh, taxa, and uh, this is in that simple model, um, looking at overall colorectal cancer. I'm still working on this analysis. It's a work in progress, but there may be some associations between some of the periodontal pathogens and colorectal cancer, but I really need to look at this by site and after full adjustment. But you can see here that at least for overall colorectal cancer without full adjustment, there appears to be two times the risk of, um, as for every standard deviation increase in porphyromonas, there appears to be two times the risk of developing colorectal cancer and some association also with Prevotella. So to conclude, there's does appear to be a, a fairly consistent association between the fecal microbiome and colorectal cancer in these cross-sectional studies, but we really need prospective studies to determine whether this association occurs prior to the development of cancer. And it really requires a fecal sample collection in these prospective cohort studies. And there's some minimal evidence for a prospective association between the oral microbiome and colorectal cancer, but I really need to dive in more to, to my data to make sure that these associations are not due to confounding. And it's the very interesting part to me was that the confounding pattern does appear to differ by site of, of colorectal cancer. So to start thinking a little bit more about this confounding, um, our group, Re, uh, repurposed some oral samples that were collected in the NHANES study to measure the oral microbiome in the 2009 to 2012 cycles of the study. And um, we published a very just early kind of presentation of what the data is, but something that was really interesting here is we saw this change in the alpha diversity over age, and this hasn't really been investigated in the past. And the NHANES study has many different many different variables that can be used to evaluate associations with the oral microbiome. And it's really important to have these comprehensive studies of the microbiome and cancer risk factors so that we can start to understand the mechanisms, determine the confounders, and potentially in the future create interventions to change the microbiome to decrease the risk of cancer. Um, so just to kind of advertise this resource, um, this data is publicly available on the NHANES website. Currently, only the alpha and beta diversity is publicly available, and the taxonomic data are restricted in the RDC, but I believe in the future they will make the, the taxonomic data also available. So there's really a wealth of information in this study that can be investigated by many different groups to look at how some of these cancer risk factors or other risk factors may be associated with the oral microbiome in a representative population in the United States. All right. So... Um, now I want to switch gears and kind of talk about some of the work that I've been doing since I began at the NCI, talking about some of the important methodological considerations for future studies. Um, and I'll be focusing on important considerations for collection, handling, and bioinformatics, and also the population of study. So I just want, I just spent a lot of my early days at the NCI working on methodological studies about how to collect samples for the oral and fecal microbiome. And to kind of just give a quick synopsis of what we found, um, it's really important that 
that one collection method is used for these comparisons. We found that each collection method appears to have kind of a little bit of its own bias. So it's really important for all, for all studies to at least internally use the same method for comparisons. If all the cases have one collection method and all the controls have a different method, you'll probably see a difference and you will never be able to disentangle if it's a collection method difference or if it's a true um, disease difference. And some methods are more appropriate than others for specific applications. Um, all of these samples for oral or fecal samples appear to be stable at room temperature for at least a certain period of time, which is ideal for fecal sample collection because as you know, it's really hard to get someone to provide a spot fecal sample. Um, so these are the kinds of methods that can be used for people to collect their samples at home and bring them in at a later time or send them by mail similarly for mouthwash. But then, for example, the FIT test, which it does work for microbiome sequencing, it doesn't work as well for fecal metabolomics. So it depends on the application. But it's really important to start collecting fecal samples in various studies so that we can start looking at risk of disease. We also conducted a large quality control project called the Microbiome Quality Control Project to evaluate the impact of laboratory handling and also bioinformatics on the microbiome outputs. And we found that the microbiome results can be impacted most greatly by the DNA extraction method used, but also somewhat by sequencing and bioinformatics. So it's very important in these future microbiome studies to use consistent protocols throughout and to thoroughly report the methods. We're often not seeing reproducibility across studies, and sometimes it's not clear if it's a methodological difference or if it's something else. So it's really important to, again, really thoroughly report what's being done. And then it's also all of the at least studies generated by with NIH funding are required to share their data and deposit their data into a re approved repository. But this data sharing can really facilitate future combined studies. And so I've been collaborating with the National Microbiome Data Collaborative to start making sure that the data is, is able to be um, apply the fair practices, the findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data practices so that these microbiome studies can be combined, can be compared, can be meta-analyzed or pooled. And so that's something that's exceedingly important going forward because a lot of these studies are, too, are gonna be potentially too small to identify associations and being able to pool the data to be, to be able to identify some moderate or weaker associations is gonna be essential. And then finally, there's been some research looking at to see how potentially race and ethnicity may be associated with the microbiome. And as we know from, from, this re from most of our research is it's not a genetic difference. It's probably these um, social determinants of health that are, 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 making, are generating these differences. So one study conducted in, in the Netherlands showed some very different um, levels of alpha diversity depending on the, the, where the person, uh, their ethnic identity. And similarly in the Southern community cohort, when they looked at um, genetic ancestry, they found that the alpha diversity also appeared to differ by being Black or, or, or African American or European American. But as we know from GWAS, there's, off, there's been kind of a persistent bias in who's represented in some of these GWAS studies. So this was a, a, um, a report that was presented a couple of years ago showing that even in 2016, 81% of individuals represented in these genetic studies were all European ancestry. And with us starting looking at, the, at these microbiome studies, it's really important to not, to not do the same thing because the microbiome may reflect a variety of known and unknown race and ethnicity related exposures, you know, different Thing, factors that happen at young age or things that are occurring at an older age. And, they, and the race and ethnicity is likely associated with the microbiome, like I said, through the social determinants of health. But the previous studies that have looked at this have you know, had a number of limitations. So it's extremely important going forward to make sure that we're including much more diverse populations in our studies of microbiome.
And so to conclude the presentation, I just want to very briefly talk about mine and some other people's plans for future microbiome studies. Um, the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics, where I work, is just initiating a new prospective cohort study called CONNECT. It's the CONNECT for Cancer Prevention Study. And this study is aiming to recruit 200,000 individuals across the U.S. We recently expanded the age range from 40 to 65 to 30 to 70. And this was actually expanded in January. To be, participate in the cohort, the, part, the individuals must have no history of cancer, and then they must be members of the partner health systems for the cohort. And the plan is to have long-term follow-up for cancer and other adverse health outcomes and serial assessments so people will have repeat questionnaires over time. We'll have comprehensive cancer and precancer outcomes and a flexible infrastructure to add different components. Um, and you can see here that, you know, there will be tumor registries, tissue specimens, that we will incorporate mobile and wearable technologies. We'll be accessing the electronic health records to find out about various health outcomes, and then serial biospecimens and serial questionnaires. Um, this is the map of, of the, the participant locations. Um, and, uh, you know, you can see that we, there was some targeting to try and get some racial and ethnic diversity in the cohort itself. Now, how does this relate to the microbiome? Well, we're planning to do a fecal microbiome collection. We're already collecting oral samples, but um, the, the work that I'm doing is to start helping to plan the fecal microbiome collection. And the idea is to have a home fecal collection where the participant collects their fecal sample on an FOBT card, which is more often used in the past for um, colorectal cancer screening. Um, and then, potentially a fecal sample collected in 95% ethanol, since that appears to be better for metabolomics. And the goal is to start our collection in late 2024. And we also aim to collect some serial samples in at least a subset of the participants. Um, and then there's also, so as I mentioned, the FOBT card used to be used more often for colorectal cancer screening, but in a lot of these health systems, they're using FIT tests for colorectal cancer screening. So we also want to plan a potential supplemental biobank of those discarded fit specimens. But the reason that wasn't our main focus is because the screening starts at the age of 50 and we want to make sure we include everyone. Also the FOBT cards are better for some of the assays we want. So potentially having both would be ideal. But then there's a number of other cohorts that are either already collecting feces or planning to collect feces such as the health professional follow-up study, the nurses health study, the cancer prevention study three, the Shanghai cohorts, et cetera. But part of the reason I was here today is because I'm really hoping that we could also start collecting some fecal samples in the Es Maestras study. I think it would be really important since this study represents the real only cancer cohort in Latin America. And it also represents a lot of different exposures that um, that are maybe different than, than some of the other microbiome studies out there. So I think this is a really great opportunity to collect samples in an ongoing cohort study. And so we'll see. Um, so to conclude, the oral and fecal microbiome have been found to be associated with cancer at a number of sites. However, these associations have not always been consistent across studies. And as I mentioned, the prospective studies are really lacking for the fecal microbiome and we really need um, you know, additional studies and additional collections to be able to investigate this. But the mechanisms through which the microbiome may be related to cancer are still somewhat unclear and it's really a need to start investigating these further too. And just to kind of, you know, foot stomp this, is the collection of oral and fecal samples in prospective cohort studies of diverse populations is really essential to being able to study the association between the microbiome and cancer risk. Um, so I just want to acknowledge the many different people who have helped me and worked on these various studies. Um, and, you know, I put my email up there too, if anyone's interested in, in talking to me at a later time. Um, I hope assume many people have joined online, but I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today and um, I welcome any questions. So thank you. Gracias.
<coughs> Muchísimas gracias. Sí, tenemos bastantes personas en línea. Entonces, eh, bueno, yo voy a empezar yo con una pregunta y luego le daré espacio a, aquí a las personas presentes y luego pasaremos a las preguntas en línea. Presumiblemente, o sea, el, el microbioma, el gut microbiome, es un promedio, ¿no? De el microbioma en, digamos, estoy imaginando en todo el tracto gastrointestinal y muy probablemente en su mayoría en el colon, ¿no? Pero es un promedio y sabemos que hay, que hay eh, distintos factores de riesgo para distintas este, zonas anatómicas de la aparición de, por ejemplo, cáncer colorectal. Entonces, ¿puedes hablar un poco de, digamos, qué se sabe sobre, digamos, el microbioma, digamos, en diferentes este, sitios de, anatómicos del colon, y además la preocupación de la contaminación, por ejemplo, por el microbioma perineal, que yo estoy suponiendo que debe ser distinto a la representación del, del, del microbioma este, en el colon. Entonces... So Part of the reason we use the fecal samples is because it's much easier to collect. And it is sort of meant to represent kind of what's happening throughout the colon as a representation. But it's not directly correlated necessarily with the resident bacteria in each site within the colon. And we do know that there's, you know, differences across the colon when you look at the tissue microbiome. But in a prospective study, we're never going to get those to be able to study that with the risk of colorectal cancer. So I think that that's kind of needed hand in hand doing, you know, the case control studies or looking at the resident bacteria in the colorectal cancers in the tissue to be able to look at that for in combination with some of these other samples that are collected. Um, we've done some work looking at, for example, in the polyp prevention trial, we collected rectal tissue biopsies from people. The polyp prevention trial was a study where individuals with an adenoma were recruited, and it was to see whether a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, high in fiber, and um, low in fats would prevent the recurrence of adenoma. And so in that study, they collected um, rectal tissue biopsies over the follow-up time. And interestingly, in those biopsies, we found cross-sectional associations with adenoma, but the baseline sample looking at the prediction of the rectal tissue biopsy with recurrence of adenoma, there really were no associations. Also, there didn't appear to be an association very much with the intervention itself, so that dietary in intervention with the rectal tissue biopsy. It's possible that some of that, that lack of association could be that the rectal tissue biopsy didn't represent the community that was potentially related to the adenoma development, but it's also possible that the community differences really are cross-sectional, that the once there's an adenoma or a, a cancer in the colon, that it, there's a change in that targeted tissue. So I think, I hope that answers your question. Um, if not, please. Okay. Alien? Thank you so much, Emily, very interesting. So my first question is like total ignorance. How, it's very clear for me how you can associate or found a causation from oral to colorectal cancer, but um, how do you explain the association with oral microbiome and lung cancer? So the hypothesis for the oral microbiome and lung cancer is, either that it's through microaspiration. So, you know, the, the microbes in our mouth do likely start to, you know, get into the lung. So that's one possibility. Then also it could be through inflammation. That's, you know, when someone has periodontal disease, they often have increased inflammation. So that's also possible. Um, I've conducted a study of the oral microbiome in breast cancer in a case control study, and we actually found a very strong association between the oral microbiome and breast cancer, which we actually would think that there's, you know, there's definitely not microaspiration to the breast. There could be bacterial translocation, or it could be inflammation, or it could be that cross-sectional thing that the women had 
you know, were ill. And so that was really the change. And so I'm also designing or starting a new study to look at the oral microbiome prospectively with breast cancer, because I think, you know, a lot of these questions we're not really sure, again, if it's a cross-sectional thing or not. But I, there's multiple hypotheses for why the oral microbiome may be related to non-oral sites. And it just differs by, by what cancer site. Yeah, because I was thinking it's difficult, like for to identify or to clean for these confounding effects of lifestyle because microbiome changes all the time. And in that sense, I was interested in how, do you see differences in men and women? I mean, here you adjusted, but are we that different in oral and fecal microbiome between men and women? Is it important? Uh, because I have read some articles that it's important what time of the cycle you're in, if you're ovulating or menstruating, and that changes your, your microbiome. And then in premenopausal women compared to postmenopausal. So what are these differences between men and women? And is it important, like hormonal uh, times to sample uh, for microbiome in women? So for the vaginal microbiome, I think that makes a really big mm -hmm. difference. Um, for the oral and gut microbiome, probably less so. We've done some studies looking at stability over time. I collected samples from 40 individuals to look at the oral microbiome over 10 months, and it was generally pretty stable over time. It appears that someone's oral microbiome is very personalized, and so the variability between like my sample at baseline to 10 months from now is much, my variability is much less than if I compared it to your microbiome overall. And so I think it's fairly stable, but that is important to think about too with, with power, like the power of these studies, because if we're taking a single sample, we need larger sample sizes to be able to detect associations. We've also done some studies looking at the fecal sample stability over time, and it seems to be pretty similar that I mean, there are certain things that can really disrupt someone's gut microbiome um, using antibiotics, et cetera. But it, when someone's re maintaining relative health, that appears to be fairly stable over time. So I think that it's not that's not as much of a concern, but I think there's still a lot of methodological questions that need to be considered. We're conducting a study of just comparing within one person their microbiome in the morning versus the afternoon. You know, I think there's a lot of methodological questions that still remain, and there's a lot of opportunities for future studies to really address some of these questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for presentation. And uh, my question is, um, do you think it is feasible the microbiological marker reported in different cancer uh, with uh, microbiome studies is um, can be used or proposed for um, prognosis biomarkers in in for, for cancer? In medium term, for example, a Fusobacterium nucleatum is uh, reported with a um, microbiological marker in, in uh, colorectal cancer. In cervical cancer, my uh, cancer model study, uh, we found a similar results in a cancer patient with the, the opinion with, with this question. Yes, yeah, so there's been a number of studies that have found that the microbiome may predict, for example, treatment response, which then would very much be related to prognosis. Um, I think there it's very likely that some of these factors are one, either related to stage of diagnosis, which would be re related to prognosis, but then also to long-term um, survival. In that breast cancer study I mentioned, the prospective study, there's also a component where I have individuals that already had breast cancer and to see if the oral microbiome may predict overall survival. And in a very simple early look of the analysis, it does appear like there may be some associations. So there may be something related to someone's current you know, microbiome status, either after you know, after diagnosis or after treatment, that may help predict um, survival. So again, I think 
this is a, a really open question and I think there's a lot more that can be done here. And I haven't personally done a lot of the research of prognosis. I've been mainly focusing on, on etiology and cancer risk, but I think that's where a lot of the focus. So it, it's, a, it's an important question and very interesting that you're finding something too. Well, hi, thanks again for your presentation. I think it's uh, amazing what you're doing and very helpful in the public health arena, but I just have three very brief questions. The first one will be um, that you mentioned that diet, medications, uh, even physical activity, of course, is going to well interact and influence, you know, the results of your findings. But also, have you even considered like air pollution? Because you mentioned that 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 can really change whatever you are doing, even if you're in your examples that could do. And the other thing is that it, you mentioned that the social determinants of health are involved. Could you mention which ones? So the pollution and the health uh, determinants, social determinants. So I think it's very possible that air pollution is impacting the microbiome. I haven't personally studied that. It's something that could be done using this data or some other data. Um, and that's so the social determinants of health, we I haven't specifically looked to see which ones are associated with the microbiome, but our thought is that these potential race ethnicity associations that we're seeing from the, the evidence of the genetic influence on the microbiome, there doesn't appear to be a, a large genetic influence on mm -hmm. a person's microbiome. So it seems that it's much more the environment, mm -hmm. which would then suggest that you know, for example, birth mode appear is, mm. is strongly associated with infant gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. And so the thought is that all of these in exposures over a lifetime potentially could be encapsulated by the microbiome. I don't think we've, you know, done an adequate job of figuring out which ones, you know, determine the most variability in someone's microbiome. Most of the time when we do these studies to show different factors, um, their association with beta diversity, there's a large proportion of the variability that's still unexplained. So I think it's really important to start to figure out what those things are that are impacting the community structure. But, you know, there's evidence for certain factors. Tobacco seems to be strongly associated with oh, yeah. the oral microbiome, mm -hmm. oral health, um, a lot, a number of other factors, alcohol use. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's a lot more that needs to be done. And like I mentioned with the NHANES study, that really represents a really great opportunity to look at just a host of, of factors to see which ones are really strongly associated with the microbiome in the okay. in the oral cavity. And very briefly, just yeah. uh, because you mentioned just uh, in your studies, the alpha diversity, and then you said also you mentioned the beta. Well, beta. Why did you just focus on the um, alpha diversity? in the first place? And is there like a weight of you have to ponderate for one or the other, or what's the importance of one over the other one? Well, so I think they're all trying to really capture what someone's microbiome encapsulates. You know, alpha diversity is, you know, just an individual diversity estimate, whereas the beta diversity is really looking at the whole microbial community. Um, then when we look at those specific taxa, that's very targeted and you know, the issue, there's some real statistical issues in the analysis of some of those. So with the relative abundance of taxa, we often with our sequencing methods can't calculate the absolute abundance. Mm -hmm. So it's all relative to the other bacteria in the sample. And that mathematically, if one taxa or one genus increases, the other genera have to decrease. That's just, you know, it's because it's constrained from zero to one. So I think in our analyses, we're really trying to just capture all of it and using some of these different metrics to try and understand what these associations are with cancer, but they all, you know, they're, they're related, but they're all somewhat different too. So it's trying to just give a global view, I guess, of the, of the microbiome with, with these outcomes. Pues quizá este, yo, la otra coordinadora del seminario está en línea, que es este... Leticia, no sé, Leti, si hay alguna pregunta en línea. Hola, ¿sí me escucha? Sí. Sí, eh, sí tenemos dos preguntas de la doctora Gaby Torres. Eh, su pregunta es, eh, thank you for your interesting presentation. Did you try for some interactions 
which are Oh, well, I think we haven't really looked at that mainly because we're very underpowered to look for interactions. Um, I think that we're in a lot of these studies are even under, you know, are potentially underpowered for some of the associations. So to look for interactions, we'd almost lose everything. Um, but I think it's something important also to think about going forward. Thank you. Um, the other question is uh, for Dr. Pizarro Gonzalez, great work. Um, can you comment on role if any may I have fungus recent travel pesticides in my in microbiome? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Can you comment on role if any may have fungus recent travel and pesticides? So, with the fungi, is there is that was that the uh, pesticides, fungi, and I didn't hear the last. And um, recent travel. Recent travel. Um, so actually, I, I love the the fungi question because I a lot of what I presented today is all bacteria, and that's not all of the microbiome. It does encompass other other microbes like fungi, viruses, um, archaea, etc., eukaryotic microbes. Um, and so I have been doing some work looking at the fungal component of the microbiome and looking at associations, for example, with head and neck cancer. And I think that what I found kind of went against the hypothesis that I had for the association, but I think it's a really important question because fungi in the mouth, for example, are much less prevalent than the bacteria, but they're also larger and they may be interacting with the bacteria. So I think it's something that we should be considering going forward. Um, and there's also other methods to measure the microbiome now. A lot of people are using shotgun metagenomic sequencing, which characterizes most of the other microbes. However, it is strongly influenced by the prevalence of the other microbes. So like often I can't use the shotgun metagenomic sequencing to characterize the fungi because they're such a, at a, such a low prevalence. As it relates to pesticides, um, the three cohorts I presented that are in the case cohort study, one of them is the agricultural health study, which is a large cohort study of farmers in the United States. And stay tuned because they are doing an analysis of pesticides with the oral microbiome, but it's very possible that, um, that there is an association, but you know we haven't really looked at it yet. Um, and then recent travel. Um, I haven't looked at that, but there was a study of two individuals that were sampling their fecal microbiome, I think every day for up to a year. And from that study, you could see a very large impact of traveler's diarrhea on the gut microbiome um, among those two people. Um, but that's not surprising since there's a scale, it's called the Bristol stool scale. I actually was talking to Martin earlier about how I talk about poop all the time and, you know, People don't want to have lunch with me anymore. But um, the Bristol School stool scale is essentially pictures of feces in various stages of consistency. And it appears that there's a really strong association between the actual level or consistency of the feces and the microbiome. Um, so it's not surprising that the gut microbiome is strongly changed when someone has traveler's diarrhea. But it's very possible. I mean, I don't think there's been enough done to see people's changes after like recent travel, but it's very possible that there could be some transient changes. Um, but I don't know how durable they are. So, thank you so much. I think we had. Do you want? Uh. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. I was wondering, since you've done quite some research on oral cancer, if you also took into account, uh, into account HPV, because you talk about smoking as confounder, but I would think that HPV would also be confounder. Yes. So in the study that um, we did of the oral microbiome and head and neck cancer, um, it was much, much older adults, and we didn't test them for HPV, but the hypothesis is that it's fairly a low prevalence in that group. Um, the NHANES study I presented, those oral samples were initially collected for studying oral HPV by Anil Chattervedi at NCI, and they were repurposed to study the oral microbiome. So I think there actually has been a study published using the NHANES data to look at that interaction. Um, 
but I think it's an important question and there, there very likely is some interaction between having HPV and the oral microbiome, but I haven't really looked at that in detail myself. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Perhaps the final question, bueno, pregunta final is, o sea, podemos pensar en alguna intervención que salga de, digamos, este tipo de investigación? Yeah, so actually there's some very interesting intervention studies. Um, there's a, a group in Israel that basically among people that were pre-diabetic, they collected, um, reg di or they were measuring glucose in these individuals over time and looking at their diet and what was influencing these glucose spikes and then incorporating their gut microbiome data they were able to basically design personalized diets that didn't cause these glucose spikes in these in these pre-diabetic individuals. And I think they're actually conducting an additional study in the United States to kind of confirm those results. I think all of us might be doing something also to look at that. But basically, I think that in the future, this data could potentially be used for some kind of personalized interventions. Um, I don't think we're there to say, you know, we should be taking a certain prebiotic or probiotic to really change cancer risk, but it's it's possible that that it will get there one day. Um, and I think that that's, like I said at the very beginning, I think what gets me excited about this is we can modify the microbiome. We know we can change it. And so it's possible that that can be used for interventions in the future. So. Okay, pues muchísimas gracias. Este, gracias, Emily. Este, gracias a todos ustedes por, por venir al, a, a este ciclo de seminarios. Y bueno, nos vemos el próximo mes. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias.